Um, uh, so can I, can I ask you guys what empathy is uh, versus, what's the difference between empathy and sympathy? And please, please type it in the chat window if you want. And Nimit, yes, there is a way to make design thinking part of it. And, and we'll talk about that. And these are great questions, by the way. So what is empathy versus sympathy? What's the difference? Yeah, I see some responses here. Sympathy is understanding a feeling. Empathy is feeling the same feeling. Uh, yeah, that's, what, that's one way to say. Not, not a bad one. Um, yeah, sympathy is more as an outsider, uh, you know, feeling for a person versus empathy is think, uh, feeling what a person is feeling. Exactly. So sympathy is much more of an external view where you're projecting what the other person, uh, uh, what you feel for the other person. It's more focused on you, your feelings for that person. Okay. Empathy is you understanding what that person is feeling. That's the difference. And, and so empathy is a much more powerful emotion than, than sympathy. Because empathy allows you to sort of, as, as we talked about uh, in design thinking, it allows you to understand the user's needs better. It's not just a nice thing to do. It's a must to do when you're trying to solve a problem, right? So it's really from my, that point of view. I'm not just saying what's small or what's not, but it's more for the purposes of what we're talking about. Um, so so that's, that's really the key uh, component. Uh, empathy is the first step in the design thinking, right? So um, empathy is really deep understanding of the problems and realities of people you're designing for. That's one part of it. It involves learning about difficulties that people face and also understanding their latent needs and desires. This is important. Not only what they're saying. Um, who said this? Um, if I asked people what they needed, they would have said a faster horse. Tell me who said that. If I asked people what they needed, they would have said a faster horse. There you go, Ford. The first major innovator in automotive design. He came up with um, um, Model T that revolutionized automotive. The way we know automotive industry today, it was because he came up with Model T that really made, it's like, I, I consider Model T to be equivalent to, uh, 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 of um, uh, iPod of that era, okay? Steve Jobs truly understood. It's not that before Model T there were no automotives, but he really put his finger on the pulse of what society needed, actually. People were not able to articulate. People said, why do I need a, a, this a noisy, smelly machine that's so expensive that can only take me five miles, right? I got a horse that can do 10 times as fast for one tenth of price, you know? So the people didn't really see the need for a machine to do for transportation. He changed that uh, and he came up with a, an accessible, easy to use, uh, and he had, he had a brilliant distribution model. Uh, he actually worked with uh, gas stations for, for fuel and so on. It's the same challenge that Tesla is now encountering that Tesla is trying to address with uh, e electronic vehicles, oh, sorry, uh, electric vehicles. So um, it, it's, you know, you, so a lot of times your stakeholders won't be able to articulate what they need, but you being able to extract that from their need, their, those needed needs is a critical element of, of empathy, empathy uh, empathization, okay? Um, so you need to understand them, their feelings, their environment, their roles interaction with that environment, okay? So I'm gonna play a quick, quick video that talks about empathy. Um, so let me see if I can move that thing from here. So welcome to Phil. So welcome to Phil, everybody. Today we're going to start in the step of empathy, which is the first step in our design thinking process. Ah! Empathy is the first step of the design thinking process. It is going out and experiencing what your end user experiences with your end user. Yeah, yeah. So, empathy is experiencing what our end users experience. We want to walk a mile in their shoes, and if we can do this, we can find spoken and unspoken needs. Empathy could look something like this.
Hold, hold up, Doc. Experience what your end user experiences. Ow. <laughs> like, like this. Oh, man. That was a lot harder than I thought. More like this. Are you gonna drink that? Man? Man? It's so unpleasant. How do you, How do, you do, that? do that every day? They really They're really going to make that easier to take. This is, this is also what empathy could look like. Who are you, who are you talking to? That's, That's empathy. If you go, if you go out and really listen to your, to your end user, user you, will you will learn. And when, and when you, learn, you learn, you can create better, better solutions based off, based off, that, off knowledge. that knowledge. This, this is, is what's key here, here at the Innovation Lab. lab. So, so, listen well and your solutions will rock. That's what I said. Um, one second. There you go. So, so that that was a funny video uh, to to talk about what uh, what you're really trying to accomplish with empathy. You didn't really talk about all aspects of empathy, um, empathization or empathize step, but it did cover most of the major ones. Um, so. You know, what I would like to do is actually go, go, make us go through a workshop. Um, uh, so empathy in design thinking really has four different components. Number one is your ability to appreciate them as human beings, seeing their world, understanding their feelings, and you being able to communicate your understanding of their, what they're thinking. So, uh, um, sorry. I'm, Trying to get through. Ah, oh, there you go. So there's an exercise that we're going to do right now, and what you're going to do is you're going to get it broken into your, you know, distributed into your 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 own groups, the groups of four to six that you you've been assigned. And here's what we're going to do. It's this is a workshop that I want you to do. Grab a piece of paper if you have that, um, and um, uh, you know, uh, and a piece and a pen. And what you want to do is uh, understand a day in the life of your peer um, during this crisis. That's one thing I want to write. During COVID-19, understand their problems, okay? Oh, I cannot go out and meet with my friends, or I cannot, uh, you know, I can't get medicine for my, uh, my grandma, right? Uh, or, you know, uh, every day I'm just sitting in front of the computer, my back is aching, right? This is my problem, by the way. So, so understanding a day during this crisis in the life of a peer, uh, peer. You, you're gonna uh, pair up, um, uh, and actually what I suggest is that you, in a group of uh, six, you have, if you have six of you, you pair up into three when you get on the call, and um, you, know, you go sequentially, uh, you're gonna get enough time to sort of do this exercise, where you're gonna ask them, you, you're gonna have them talk about their day, and you're gonna pay attention to, in the two by two, on a piece of paper, you're gonna listen for first, let's say two or three minutes, that your peer is gonna talk to you. You're gonna listen to what they're saying. You're gonna uh, look at what they're doing. So that's on the left side of, of the two by two, the you know, uh, X, Y axis, uh, you know, the, the second quadrant and third quadrant. And then you're gonna write down also on, in the first quadrant and the fourth quadrant, what are they thinking and what they're feeling, okay? You have, this is your understanding they're saying something and they're doing something with their hand gestures and so on. They're making some certain like their eyebrows or whatever, right? But you are trying to guess at what they're thinking and you're trying to get a sense of what they're feeling, okay? When they're, they're sharing their day, okay? This is your empathy map. It's called the empathy map, okay? From this will come out uh, what they might, what, called, un, what kind of unmet needs might there be. And the way I want you guys to do that, when you get into the breakout sessions, you have six of you, Pair up into two each, and sequentially because you can't do this in the breakout session of six, right? Uh, start first pair first, go back and forth. Stick two two minutes each, two minutes of one person talking and the other person taking notes, and then flip it and do that uh, maybe for a couple more pairs, and then uh, create your empathy map. And then we're gonna come back here and we're gonna talk about what you guys what you guys learned. Okay.
Uh, we're going to just pick some examples uh, from empathy map that you may have. So, um, so why don't we why don't we uh, do the breakout session now? Actually, why don't we use the time in the meanwhile while the workshop is being created? Uh, uh, sorry, the breakout session is being created. Um, uh, why don't we just uh, do back and forth? So, normal. Your question was: Does design thinking only depend upon building up products? Does it focus also on the emotional problems like stress and depression? It actually does. So, in fact, I we just kicked off. Um, uh, this is the third uh, cohort of the uh, you know design thinking is called design to lead uh, for some of the students here in the Bay Area that are working on mental health. So they are actually going to use design thinking to understand uh, the the mental health issues, stress, depression, things like that, and potential ways of intervention. And by the way, interventions don't have to be technology interventions only. They can be um, uh, they can be uh, communication interventions. So one of the and met needs uh, our fellows in India found out uh, was in rheumatic heart disease uh, in cardiology. Uh, there are a lot of these um, you know rural folks who have rheumatic heart disease early on in their lives that doesn't get addressed because uh, it comes from strep throat. They didn't get antibiotics in time, so they now have what is called rheumatic heart disease, which affects their their heart valves, and uh, it, progressively the valve gets worse and they, their heart stops functioning the way it's supposed to. They, what they realized was they could come up with a new valve uh, a, a device to, to fix that, but the, it's much better to address the problem in the very early stages and uh, awareness of this disease and asking parents to go to a doctor as soon as you have strep, uh, sore throat that may seem like a symptom of a strep throat is much better intervention than having a device later on because it's already too late. So the intervention, they came up with a very simple Bollywood style video, a three minute video, at some point I'll show you guys. Uh, you know, there's Radha as a character, very nice video, animation. That actually really makes a big impact. The awareness le levels go down, go up from 0% to 94% in that, that uh, community population. These are people who are not highly educated people and yet uh, this, that intervention works. So, you know, that's the other thing, this technology is not the only way to intervene. Um, can you please go over the quadrants of empathy map again, especially the difference between observed and input parts? So what you're doing in the third, second and fourth quarter, a third quadrant is you're paying attention to what the other stakeholder is saying. So let's say you're fire uh, prepared. Let's say Sanjeet, you and Nirmal are part of the same team, the same group of six people. You and, and uh, you, uh, Sanjeet and Nirmal are paired. Nirmal starts saying something. Oh, my day is like this. I get up in the morning. I brush my teeth. I do this. And, and so as he's walking through his day over the next two to three minutes very quickly. Sanjeev, you are paying attention to what he's saying and you're making notes on that on the, in the second quadrant. And you're also making notes on what he's doing. His, you know, his eye movement, his, his you know, uh, scrunching of the eyes or you know, whatever he's doing actually, right? His gestures and so on. And uh, once you're done with that, you pause for a minute and on, in the first quadrant and fourth quadrant, you write down uh, what, what do you think he thought during that time? Or what do you think he felt during that time? So that's what you're, that's your inference. That's not what you observe. What you observe is what's on the, on the second and, and third quadrant. What you are, uh, what you infer is in the first and fourth quadrant. Does it answer your question, Sanjeev? Uh, do large corporations use design thinking? They're starting to. Uh, and, uh, you know, they, this, you know, it's interesting. Large corporations have seen this as a buzzword and they bring uh, really high paid consulting organizations like ours to do these workshops. In fact, we are doing focus on organizational leadership change uh, and we're bringing design thinking there. But whether they actually practice it or not is, is debatable. Uh, I think there, there are at least stages of that in my opinion. Um, yeah, do they do use design thinking for product development is your question. Actually, yeah, increasing co companies are using design thinking for uh, defining their, the uh, the problem sets and the solutions that they come up with. There are, uh, I know of at least six or seven major med tech companies that use that explicitly. There's a whole team of uh, 35, 40 at Edwards Life Sciences, for example, that focuses on that. In fact, they're, the chief technology officer is an ex design uh, director. Um, doesn't inferring from observations in corporate? Absolutely, Sanjeev. Uh, it does not bring in bias but you're trying to be as unbiased and, and any bias that you may uh, uh, incur in the uh, process of inferring 
you should you should be explicit about it and we'll talk about it you think what happens is when you become acutely aware of it you'll start to see your biases get filtered out right i'll give you an example right i i think i'm a very race neutral person i don't think i'm racist i i think i'm i've, I've been actually very empathetic towards a broad group of uh, um, you know races uh, in, in, and their challenges but during this whole black lives matter movement i have been confronted with biases that i did not exist knew i did not know existed within me about african american population like i i talked about how why is there looting why is looting okay Lo looting is wrong in my from my point of view but that was a, that was coming from a biased perspective because there's there's history to the looting it's not a, it's not okay looting is still not okay but my understanding of looting was rooted in what i was seeing today you know and it was uh, rooted in my biases it was not informed by what the history was um so is sampling a good idea to resolve population based problems while practicing design thinking it is because um you know um uh, you may you'll not get it perfect and think of populations any population even this the group of 50 60 that you are 54 there is a there is a gaussian distribution right you no matter which parameter you look uh, iq you look at uh, mechanical skills hand eye coordination you know sense of humor no matter what parameter you choose there is going to be a gaussian distribution right so there is a diversity so you can never ever uh, precisely define de develop a solution for uh, for an entire population you can define develop it for one person but you can't do it for everybody this is where precision medicine is ultimately trying to go it's a, it's, a, it's a ways off but what you're trying to do is you trying to get a representative sample of that population by the way you can choose to pick the first sigma you know not the 66.6% in the middle the one sigma uh, plus and minus but you could go to the ends of the spectrum and you say i'm going to focus on that they are the ones who need the intervention the most so you'll still have to define the group and you'll still have to sample example from that group uh, and sampling from that group does involve Certain uh, element of uh, potential risk that you will not be appropriately representing the population. That's why this iterative approach comes in. So, uh, what, what was your experience, guys? I, I would love to hear your experiences. Um, uh, and so you can you can just use the chat window uh, to to type in. Was it? Did you get to know your team members? Did you? Uh, uh, were you able to capture? Were you able to do a a, a session on empathy? Um, and were you able to capture what what were what were the unique give me some of the examples of what some of the what some of, some of your um notes were in terms of the say versus think i'm interested in that a lot say versus think say versus feel rather yeah go ahead <laughs> and she'll say to give new people after a long time if only for that reason this workshop would have been successful that's a good one ansho um So uh so uh, Namita do you want to share um uh, a, a, a maybe a, a note a note that you might have made uh, or somebody in your group might have made I think you didn't need more time Vishesh uh, 10 minutes is too short I was going to give you guys half an hour but uh, but we it took a little longer we will we'll get it right next time next next session Yeah. So one of the and one of the challenges uh, that we found most um, uh, uh, it says one of the teammates misses college company being at home for such a long time. Um, that's good. Um, right. So micro cues. That's right. The myth. Uh, I don't know if you captured anything about those micro micro cues. It was pretty cool to know how someone else's. handling uh, the crisis and going about their everyday tasks so can, can you zai can you share a specific example of uh, what you found one of my teammates hasn't wandered out for last 100 days yeah internet issues for some people were bad during quarantine yeah that's 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 actually a it must be a common uh, challenge area uh, and it has become really important the role of internet in our lives right now is more pronounced than ever before i mean you guys are are young so internet was always important to you guys but i suspect this is completely different scale different um you know uh, uh degree to which this plays an important role because it's the only connection you have with the rest of the world right um <clears throat> uh 
Anxiety of one of the teammates to go out and get groceries has to be responsible. Absolutely. I think that's actually a really important one. I know of many folks that are going out and getting medicines for their parents or their loved ones, and it's a, they're putting themselves at risk. It's almost like going to a battle, right? Um, it's an invisible battle, but it's a battle nevertheless. Um, Yeah, there's a there's something about the, somebody not being ready with the presentation, which is a key one. Um, an availability of an ideal list for work. Yeah, if we're all sitting at home, we have multiple family members. We probably don't have a properly set up offices at home, right? Uh, we don't have tables set up. It's, it's not set up as our your dorms are, your your hostels are. So that that can be a, definitely a challenge. That's a very interesting one, by the way. By the way, though I'm point I'm pointing out some of the ones where I think there may be an unmet need. Right. So if somebody can come, think about this. Right. Let's pause there. If you uh, see that a lot of students are dealing with this problem right now, not just IIT Bombay students, they're where they don't have an appropriate desk to work. Right. Uh, they they can't put the top, they're putting the laptops on a lap, sitting on the bed, or whatever they're finding rooms, or maybe the rooms themselves are not. Uh, they're getting on calls, or they're getting involved. In, they're doing classes, online classes. They don't have noise-free environment. Maybe there is some, there is a need there. There's an unmet need there that you could potentially address through innovation, just in this example. Another example that came up about is the going out and getting medicines or groceries. So maybe there is a, there's a solution, there's a need there, unmet need there that can be articulated. So each of these observations, as you can see, actually allow you to start to think about what the unmet needs could be. And you could articulate that need. So the need that I think I, I could about the table one, I let me try to articulate that need. There is a need for a working platform, okay, for college going kids, college going students who are participating in online classes um, uh, so that they have uh, a productive sort of, and then they can, you know, you can, the outcome is, the outcome needs to be defined a little bit better. I'm just making this up right now. So, so that they're, they have, they get a great A grade in their scores or some such thing, but I'm, I'm making that of course. So you, you can see the, how you can actually form a very structured need statement from that one observation alone. Stuff that you have in here from just from those, um, uh, those observations, you can come up with five or six need statements. Okay. And when I give you guys exercise for, uh, for, for this week, that, that's actually going to be one of the things um, I'm going to ask you guys to do and I'll, I'll come to that. Um, need to manage the many tasks with managing household Sure, absolutely. Me, I'm having to do that. You know, my wife wants, wants me to do the dishes uh, because you know she's having to do so much at home. Uh, so I'm actually trying to juggle the two things as well. What I'm doing, I'm on calls whole day long with my my different jobs. You know, so it's it's absolutely true. Classes, groceries, housework, everything is blended together. There's no break between classes and whatever. You didn't have to contend with any of this before, right? So absolutely. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pause here. Uh, these are great, actually. Thank you. Thank for, thanks for all of these comments, all of these observations. These are very important observations. And this is, you just got your first taste of what is called immersion. You did this by asking each other, what you do when you're doing immersion is you observe people without even saying something. You, you can talk to them and that's one way. There are multiple ways of doing immersion uh, needs finding. One is asking people, one is just observing them, okay? And the observing piece happens when you are, you are, let's say, in the surgical uh, OR, right? You're ob observing a surgeon and a nurse and their interaction and, you know, where things may be uh, a bit of a challenge. So that's the observation piece where you're being a fly on the wall. Same thing you could do, you know, um, when you, you can observe uh, uh, these migrant workers in, in their settings, if you could physically observe them. Unfortunately, you can't. So we, we can uh, replace that with uh, using videos that may be available online, some social media from news or news organizations and so on. Okay, so I'm gonna to come to that now and then we'll end the session for today. So here's the deliverables for the next week. What I want you guys to do for the next week is do secondary research on unmet needs amongst the underserved, okay? Underserved, not your peers. Today I asked you guys to focus on your peers, right? In this uh, workshop that we just did. I want you guys to focus on the underserved fine tune your observational skills uh, through, through secondary research because you can't do primary research. You can't go out and talk to the research. Unless you, you have meetings coming at home, you can actually talk to them. That's actually, you can observe their, their challenges. Like if they, 
uh, she has to contend with the shutdown and lack of access of things at her home, your maid, while she ha also has to come and work, if that's still going on. Um, and there's, a, there's, I mean, she has to contend with multiple things at the same time, right? Uh, multiple challenges. So uh, focus on underserved, the needs of underserved during COVID-19 uh, in, in, in India. And use news reports, journal articles, if there are any, um, probably not, do Google, you know, go to social media, uh, you know, if you can uh, talk to some other stakeholders who work closely with uh, the, the underserved. There are a lot of different ways you can do it, but I want you guys to, as a team, uh, six of you, each of you, split up and uh, figure out how you're going to do secondary research. And, and I'm going to work with the TAs to uh, engage you guys and make sure that you, you don't get stuck. We only have six days before we meet again. And so you have a lot of observations. One thing that you can do, and I want to show that we don't have time for today, is video, uh, you know, uh, video reports, news reports, could be really powerful tools. So for example, there are a lot of these news uh, channels that are interviewing these uh, migrant workers, as an example, right? And by the way, migrant workers is just one class of underserved. The underserved could be old people who are living by themselves. They are underserved too, right? It doesn't matter which economic background they come from or rural people. There's a lot of COVID-19 going on rural people. You don't have to focus on healthcare needs, by the way. You can focus on non-healthcare needs also. Let's keep this open. Even though a lot of the examples I'm gonna provide are gonna be gonna come from healthcare, you don't have to. Your group can decide which top, which, you know, do you wanna frame on healthcare a broader set of needs during COVID-19? And, and please ask any questions. Could you define the underserved category a bit? And I think what I just said, Zaid, hopefully helps with that. So it could be your maids, I'll give you examples. Your maids are underserved. Your rural, rural people, folks who live in rural areas are underserved. People who live in, uh, in slums, urban slums are underserved. Um, so economically, um, you know, lower, lower capacity uh, or living in regions that, that are not well served. That's, that's how you define underserved. And you come up with the definition of underserved from your perspective, and I would love to hear that next time. So this, I'm giving you that opportunity to define underserved as well, okay? And what I want to hear from you as a team, and I, I want these deliverables, these are group deliverables, not individual. Each team delivers one. And I would like these in, in a Word document format, Google Doc format or Google presentation format. Uh, talk about the background of the COVID-19 crisis in India, the challenges that you found, who the key stakeholders are involved in that, you know, government, local government, you know, uh, you know the, the grocery stores, whatever. Figure out who your key, key stakeholders are that have a role to play in that underserved community and its needs, okay? Uh, what are the potential quote-unquote immersion sites? And immersions, you can't physically go there, right? So what places can you go and get on the phone and, and, uh, and, and speak with these, these stakeholders? Uh, and which stakeholders would you, would, you, would you need to interview? When we meet next time, if you can, uh, I, I, you can have these observations and some unmet needs. And if you can structure them in that sentence, the way I said, um, you, know, uh, under, you know, the problem, uh, which population, we define the population already, you can go even zoom even, even more to the unmet, uh, underserved population. Uh, it could be the migrant workers, it could be the maids, it could be, um, you know, uh, the people living in rural areas, it could be old people living alone. You can define that group as you're defining that, that need statement. And if you can, even if you have only a couple of need statements by, you can have lots of observations, you should have lots of observations. But uh, if you can have a couple of unmet need statements, that would be awesome. It'll, be, it'll make for a great discussion. 